Hello everyone, uh, you are all very welcome to Värt att veta, worth knowing, the lecture series that presents important research findings in a way that we can all understand. The series Worth Knowing is organized by the SLU Library and my name is Karin Benmarker and I will host this uh, seminar today together with Lucia Hatamian and Jennifer Salomonsson from the library. You will be able to ask questions after the lecture in the chat or by raising your hand. Please keep your microphones on mute as the lecture will be recorded and the recording will be published on the Worth Knowing website later. Matthias Johansson and Clara Nilsson are both doctoral students at the Department of Molecular Sciences at the Maud Langton Lab here at SLU. Clara's educational background comes from the UK and France, and she has finished her master's degree at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. And Matthias has a master's degree in biotechnology from Chalmers University of Technology in Gothenburg. So after a very short introduction of Clara and Matthias, it's now time to listen to the very exciting research that Clara and Matthias um, have focused on. The title of today's lecture is 3D printing of protein and fiber rich foods. So Clara and Matthias, the floor or the screen rather is yours. Thank you very much Karin for that kind introduction. Uh, so my name is Matthias Johansson uh, and with me I have my colleague as well. Uh, Clara, if you want to say hi. Yes. Yes. Hello everyone, <laughs> I'm Clara. Uh, perfect, um, so I think we'll just get started directly. Um, so the, the topic of today's presentation is faba beam fractions for 3D printing of protein and fiber rich foods, uh, which is a project that we worked with uh, recent years. Um, but before we dive into the results of our own project, uh, we thought it would be nice to kind of start off with a brief introduction of uh, 3D printing uh, of foods and why it um, gives some reasons on why it's gotten quite some interest in recent years uh, in the food industry uh, and food science. Uh, and one of the major reasons why people work with uh, food 3D printing today is to create more appealing foods uh, for different reasons. Uh, and one specific target group for this is people with swallowing difficulties, uh, which is a very common problem among elderly uh, in particular. Uh, and typically the, the food that they get is pâtés and puris in, in quite boring uh, shapes. Uh, and even if there are of course multiple flavors uh, and from multiple different like ingredients, most of them look quite similar and quite boring in terms of their shape. Uh, so eating these foods um, every day will of course quite quickly become a bit boring. Uh, so the idea with using 3D printing here uh, would be to add more variety in terms of the shape of the product. Uh, so for example, instead of just squeezing out this, this broccoli puree uh, on the plate, you could maybe then um, print it in the shape of a, of a broccoli for for creating more appealing foods. Uh, and there is also the possibility to personalize uh, the foods in terms of nutritional needs. Uh, so a 3D printer typically has multiple syringes that you can use for printing. Uh, and this could then be used to kind of custom make the, the nutritional values of the foods to, for certain needs. Uh, and then you can also easily adjust the, the amounts uh, of the printed foods. Uh, and you can also personalize uh, foods by creating kind of decorations or, or art, which is typically used for, let's say, cakes and desserts, where you can create uh, shapes and figures that are very difficult to do by hand. Uh, and then another reason could be to kind of create fun shapes uh, for children, maybe in the future when 3D printing uh, become more uh, available for also the, the average person. So maybe people will have their own 3D printer in the kitchen and maybe then you could print again, let's say this broccoli puree uh, in a shape of, a, I don't know, a car, a tree or house or something that would make the, the ch children more interested in eating vegetables. Uh, and then another reason could be to kind of recreate different textures. So it could be meat textures, but with plant-based ingredients. Uh, and it could also be to create completely new uh, textures 
Uh, and now we will just give a few examples uh, of some companies that already today utilize the technique of 3D printing in the food industry. Uh, most of these, I should say, they are on a kind of startup scale or small scale. Uh, some of them have products on the market already, but then on very small scales uh, so far. Uh, so first we have, for example, Redefine Meat and Nova Meat, uh, working with plant-based steaks uh, and chicken. Uh, and the reasoning they argue that why using 3D printing rather than other techniques uh, would be that they can kind of recreate this fibrous uh, texture uh, from, from example, chicken uh, using by kind of aligning the, the filaments during printing. Uh, and then they also state that they have much higher resource efficiency. Uh, so compared to then when you get a steak from an animal, of course, the whole animal will not be be a steak, so you will have a lot of waste uh, material. Whereas if you print the steak, you essentially only print the steak, uh, which would then lead to a better resource efficiency. Uh, and then also they they use in the terms or looking at steaks, they use this to kind of the, the 3D printing technique to kind of recreate this fat muscle marbling, for example, which is very difficult uh, uh, using kind of other techniques available. Uh, another example is a collaboration uh, between Rice and a few companies uh, where they work with what we saw before with this broccoli puree uh, to print it in a more appetizing or uh, yeah, more appetizing kind of uh, good looking uh, uh, shape uh, and this, yeah, and also create more nutritious uh, food for, for people in particular than with swallowing difficulties. Uh, then we also have Barilla, uh, who has used 3D printing to create pasta in different unique and exclusive shapes that they could not create with their uh, kind of normal production methods. Uh, and then there's also quite a few companies working on these kind of personalized cakes using creating figures of chocolate and, and sugar uh, and so on. Uh, and the final slide before we dive into our own results and our own study. Uh, so just to highlight that there are different types of 3D printing techniques that could be used for food. Uh, and first off, we have something called binder jetting, uh, where you basically spread out a layer of a powdered uh, food material, and then you use the, the printer to eject the liquid binding agent that will kind of solidify the powder where it's ejected uh, to kind of build up uh, a figure or something, and then you add a new layer of powder, which you then again solidify to build up your structure layer by layer. Uh, and very similar, you use this selective laser sintering printing, uh, use the same technique, which is kind of creating your uh, products layer by layer uh, from a powder material. But instead here you use a, a laser to kind of solidify uh, your sample. Uh, but the drawback with these two methods is that you have to have a food that's available as a powder form and can then be bound together either, let's say, by heat or some binding, binding agents. Uh, what we have used uh, in our study is something called extrusion-based printing, which is kind of, I think, straightforward, but you have your kind of edible material or paste that you then deposit or extrude uh, layer by layer to build up your product. Uh, and we will also see a video uh, on how this looks later on. Um, and then there's also inkjet printing, but that's more used for kind of surface filling and image decorations by dropping your, your uh, material onto a surface of, in this case, a food. Um, so that was a short introduction on food 3D printing and why we use 3D printing or others use 3D printing uh, today in food industry. Um, but we now will talk about our project, which was on 3D printing of faba bean based uh, material. Uh, and the idea here was to see if we could use faba beans uh, and, uh, well, uh, materials extracted from faba beans uh, to create protein and fiber rich uh, snacks using 3D printing. Uh, and the image you see here is a kind of visual overview of the, the workflow that we have. Uh, so we start off in the top left corner with our beans. Uh, from which we extract essentially fiber, protein, and starch. Uh, and then we combine these in different ratios and mixed with water to create our bio inks that we then use for printing. Um, and we also characterize these uh, inks in terms of their rheological properties. Uh, and then we 
took these uh, the cubes that we printed. Um, so as you see, we also printed, um, you have two images here uh, and one is kind of a rectangular infill pattern. And then we also have this more honeycomb-like infill pattern. Uh, so we created cubes with different recipes and these two different infill patterns. Uh, and then we looked at the microstructure and the texture properties uh, of these printed objects. Uh, and just to summarize uh, before we go into the details, the findings uh, that we found uh, in this project was that we, uh, we could produce uh, printable inks uh, from fractions extracted from fava beans. Um, and then we saw a large effect on the textural properties in the end, depending on the composition. Uh, we also saw a large effect of the direction of compression uh, on the textual properties. Uh, on the other hand, we did not see a large effect of the different infill patterns we tested. Uh, and then we also looked at the microstructure and compared this with the textual properties uh, and found some correlations between them. Um, so here we have the, the different recipes uh, that we used. Uh, so to the left, you have the uh, protein and starch uh, and fiber distribution in the different samples. And then to the right, we've also included the, the water content in the different samples. Uh, so essentially we have what we call a fiber rich sample, which has uh, the most fiber of the samples. So you see the blue, the blue uh, part of the graphs here. Uh, and then we have a starch rich sample containing mainly starch, uh, a protein rich sample with mainly protein and then a sample without fiber. Uh, and what we see uh, when we also look at the water uh, amount in the different samples is that we needed more water, uh, essentially the more fiber and starch we had in our different recipes uh, in order to in the end get the like, similar properties of the different uh, recipes. Uh, and this is essentially due to the different water absorption or swelling capacity of the different proportions where we saw that the, the fiber and starch has a larger or better ability to kind of bind the water, which leads us to need more water in these samples rich in starch and fiber to create similar properties of the different uh, recipes. Uh, and then we did something called a biological characterization of the inks. Uh, so rheology is basically the study of how material flows uh, and the forms. Uh, and, and these properties uh, are very important for uh, yeah, materials used for 3D printing uh, and to kind of evaluate their success. Uh, so in the case of extrusion-based printing, uh, the material first of all needs to be able to flow or be extruded through the nozzle uh, that we have, but then it also has to keep its structure after the position. Uh, and using these kind of rheological measurements, you can get an idea of if your material will work uh, or not for extrusion-based 3D printing. Uh, and something that you typically measure when you do these rheological measurements is the storage and loss modulus. Uh, so the storage modulus is essentially the, the energy that will be stored in your material upon deformation, whereas the loss modulus is the energy lost as, uh, as heat. Uh, so essentially the storage modulus characterizes the uh, solid part or solid characteristics of your material, whereas the loss modulus characterizes the, the viscous a response from your material. Uh, and then we have something called the ton delta, which is essentially the ratio between the two. Uh, and what you can see from the ton delta is that if you have a very low ton delta, that means that you have a more solid-like behavior of a sample uh, or material, whereas a high ton delta means that you have a more viscous behavior of your material. Uh, so what we can see here is that the fiber-rich and the starch-rich samples, they have a more solid-like behavior. Uh, whereas the protein rich and protein and starch rich sample, they have a more viscous behavior. Uh, and we will see how this affects then the properties of the, uh, of the printing uh, later on. Uh, and we also have something called the yield stress. Uh, so essentially this will tell you something about the, the shape stability of the material, you could say. So if you have a high uh, yield stress, you would be able to basically deposit quite like a lot of layers onto each other without the structure collapsing. Whereas if you have a low yield stress, um, the structure would collapse with uh, fewer layers basically. Um, 
and then we will show you a short video if it works on how the 3D printing looks. Um, so this is just kind of how we how we did or produced our products. Uh, so you see the kind of build up of the structure uh, layer by layer by extruding the material. Um, and then after printing, uh, we have our, our samples, uh, uh, which we then actually freeze dried uh, to create this kind of snack or crispy texture uh, of the products. Uh, and the first thing we notice here is that the protein and starch root samples uh, at the very bottom of the image, uh, they have a bit of a less distinct shape. Uh, so we could see that the, the samples, they have a tendency to slightly lose their shape uh, with time, as you see from the kind of curved uh, walls uh, of the printed cubes, whereas the fiber rich and the starch root sample, they are more straight walls and tend to keep their structure uh, in a better way. Uh, and we could also see a slight uh, change in the color depending on the uh, composition of the material. And then, yeah, I should point out also that this, this difference in the shape stability that we see in the different objects could then be related to what we saw before uh, with the fiber rich and starch rich samples having both a higher yield stress, uh, but also a more solid like uh, behavior. Uh, so, overall, the fiber rich and the starch rich samples show the best properties in terms of shape st stability and producing cubes most similar to the model that we used. Uh, and now my colleague Clara will continue to present the results from the texture and microstructural analysis of these samples. Yes, thank you, Matthias. So um, everyone can hear me right? It's uh, perfect. Um, so we, um, to measure the texture of our samples, we compressed our cubes either from the top um, with the, now the arrow, yes, from the top with the pattern facing upwards or from the side with the infill pattern facing towards the side. What we wanted to investigate was uh, how the different recipes, infill pattern and uh, direction of compression, the, so top or side, influenced the texture of our um, cubes. Um, I'm going to play you a little video of what the compression test looks like, but basically we have this probe that is lowered at a specific strain rate and load, and uh, it crushes the cubes. And uh, when we crush a cube, we measure the force required uh, to, uh, yeah, to compress the cubes. And this kind of corresponds to the hardness of the cubes. So let's have a little look. So when we've crushed the cubes, we're left with this kind of yeah, powder or dust or crushed matter. Here we see the results from our uh, compression tests. Here we have the uh, peak force. So the force required to compress our cubes from above or from the top. And then also the strain required. And the strain you can think of as the amount of deformation. Here in the B graph, we have the force required to compress our cubes from the side, and then also the strain. Um, as Matthias mentioned, when he was describing the cubes, our protein and starch rich cubes had uh, concaved walls. And because of these concaved walls, we decided not to compress the cubes from the side. So what did we see? Well, we saw that compressing the cubes from above or from the top required five to 10 times more force than compressing the cubes from the side. This would mean that uh, the cubes compressed from the top, or if you would think that you would bite the cubes from 
the top rather than having the infill pattern facing towards the side, that they would be perceived as harder. Our protein rich and protein and starch rich cubes, so the ones with high protein content, were also significantly harder compared to our carbohydrate rich cubes. The infill pattern did not have any significant uh, influence on the um, uh, yeah on the required force uh, to compress the cubes. So already. In the lab, we could see that uh, the direction of compression, so from the top or from the side, had an influence um, on the fragments that we uh, got during the crushing. So if we look here in the A image, we have the protein-rich cubes that were compressed from the tops. So these were the ones that produced the hardest, required the most force to be compressed. And we can see that we have uh, relatively small fragments and um, uh, yeah and there's also small variation in the size of the fragments most of the particles are almost dust like in their character here in the b graph uh, when we compressed our cubes from the side we got a much larger variation in the pieces of our fragments but also uh, we got uh, some extremely large fragment pieces. And it appears that uh, when we crushed our cubes from the side, that they broke off layer by layer. This starch-rich honeycomb uh, cube was also the ones that required the least amount of force when they were compressed from the side. Here we have two graphs showing the size distribution of the fragments produced after the compress, uh, compre side compress, well, the top or the side compression. As we already saw in the last image, compressing the cubes from the side uh, caused smaller variation in the fragmentation size of our particles. And in general, uh, the particles were a lot smaller compared to when we compress the cubes from the side. The majority of our particles were less than one millimeter square in area. Now, if we go over to this graph, we have uh, the area of our compressed cubes uh, from the side. And as we already saw, uh, there is a much larger variation and there's also a much higher prevalence of these very large uh, pieces or fragments. There were even some fragments that had uh, had an area as big as 100 uh, millimeter squared. Here we have some scanning electron microscopy images of our samples. Um, so these, um, now we see this porous structure here in all our images. And this is caused by the water um, freezing during uh, the water first freezing and then being sublimated during the freezing and freeze drying process. Our carbohydrate rich samples, so the fiber rich and the starch rich, had a more perforated structure and also a more irregular kind of porous structure compared to our protein rich and our protein and starch rich samples. Uh, the samples with a higher protein content um, had a smoother surfaces that were more rounded along uh, the pores. Uh, now, a theory is that this more compact structure we see both in the protein rich and the protein and starch rich uh, samples could be the reason for why they required a higher force uh, during the compressions. Uh, when we looked at the native structure of our uh, fiber, starch, and uh, protein fractions before actually making our cubes, um, we saw that the fiber fractions also had um, were about 25 times bigger than the protein fractions or the protein granules and about 10 times bigger than the starch granules. So the, this could also be a reason why you have this more open porous structure when you have incorporated uh, fiber into our uh, samples. So 
here we have a PCA plot that kind of uh, summarizes and maps out uh, our different uh, variables. And let's see where my mouse is, it's here. Um, so observations that are correlated with each other are grouped together, whilst, op uh, whilst observations that uh, have the opposite correlation are on the other end of the graph or the plot. When you look along the x-axis, so this middle line, the variables that are the closest to the x-axis are the most significant uh, for uh, the variation. So we can see here that the protein accounted for many of the differences that we saw between our samples, the protein contents. Uh, in general terms, our uh, high protein uh, uh, or yeah, our high protein samples, so the protein rich and protein and starch rich samples could be characterized as having a darker color, smoother walls, uh, more swollen infill pattern. Um, they also required uh, more force during compression and produced uh, uh, smaller and more numerous uh, fragments. Next, when you look at the PCA plot, you look along uh, the y-axis. So essentially we are looking at which variables are either on the top or which ones are on the bottom. And uh, here then we are comparing, for instance, the differences between our carbohydrate rich samples and our protein rich, uh, our protein samples. So although our carbohydrate uh, rich uh, samples were more alike, uh, there were some differences. So for instance, in the PCA plot, uh, we can see that having a higher starch content is also correlated with a higher required printing uh, pressure. We also have a plot here, the plot B on the top right. And here we see our samples mapped out in relation to each other, but also relating to the variables that we just discussed. Uh, so on the left, we have the protein rich and protein and starch rich samples, which attributes are highly influenced by the high protein content. On the other side, we have the starch rich and fiber rich uh, samples that are uh, highly influenced by their either their starch or high fiber content. And uh, we were also quite happy to see that the protein and starch rich samples were in opposite correlation to the fiber rich samples as these uh, samples, the uh, protein and starch rich ones did not contain any fiber. Uh, something else we can see from this uh, plot is that uh, although there does exist some variation between our um, samples or within the groups, uh, there most of the variation we see actually happens between the different groups. So to conclude our project, uh, the protein starch and fiber rich fractions extracted from fava bean can successfully be combined to create a nutritious printable inks for extrusion based uh, 3D printing. The inks with the lower loss tangent uh, showed a higher shape stability. Uh, the ink composition had a clear effect on the textural properties of our freeze-dried 3D printed objects. Uh, the infill pattern did not. And an increased heterogeneity of the microstructure seemed related to a decrease in the peak force during the compression. So uh, these uh, more heterogeneous samples required less uh, force when we were compressing them. I would like to uh, finish off by uh, thanking everyone who was involved in this uh, project. So here we have uh, Fanny, who uh, is an internship student from uh, AgroSup Dijon in uh, France. Uh, she did a lot of the lab work. She was also the one who came up with the different recipes. Then we have Matthias, uh, who, uh, started off this presentation and uh, Matthias 
was really the brains behind the project. He was the one who came up with the idea and he was also the one who recruited Fanny. And of course, he's also done a lot of the lab work. Uh, we have Maud, who's our supervisor as uh, we are part of the Langton lab. And there is me. And I guess we should also introduce the 3D printer. So uh, thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much, Clara and Matthias. This was super interesting. I just think that, oh my God, are we, we're actually in the future now. <laughs> uh, but I, I have a couple of questions before I let the, the audience in. Uh, may, why did you choose cube, the cubic form? And not um, because it was mostly practical or? Yeah. I guess uh, mostly because of the practical uh, point. Uh, it's quite an easy or simple kind of model uh, to use. Uh, and then we could also easily do these compression tests, uh, I assume, which would not work for, for different samples, maybe. Uh, not in the same way, uh, easy way at least. OK, all right, thanks. Yeah, uh, I just was thinking if you try to print the infill pattern in a, a different direction to see if that uh, uh, was uh, doing anything to the force, like if you laid, laid it down or something. Uh, we did not uh, try this, and I think it would also be a bit difficult, more difficult to, to print. Uh, well, it depends on how you would lay it, maybe. I think I... But I, I was just thinking because the layers itself could uh, be one reason why it's uh, more stable in one, one direction. That's yes, why. yeah. But I, I see the problem with the uh, infill in another direction. Yeah, but I think, as you said, uh, we think also the largest, I mean, the major reason why we see the difference depending on which direction we compress them is because we have this layering effect of the infill pattern. Uh, so that would, of course, affect the, the properties if we uh, lay this in a different direction, let's say. Mm. Yes, we did also see when we were printing our samples, um, I believe it was the honeycomb that produced the best cubes. Uh, compared to the grid. So uh, also you want a pattern that actually, you know, is easy to print and uh, holds its shape. Yeah, I, I think it was a good presentation. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. It was really interesting. So what is the next step of this research? Uh, what would you do next? And I'm also very curious how you, how you came to, to, to study this uh, in the first place. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I think the main reason is mainly that we have this uh, printer. Uh, <laughs> so, so we thought some way to make use of it, uh, I guess, is the, the simple answer. Uh, but then we also thought, I mean, because many of these 3D printed, when you do 3D printing of foods, you typically add these kind of thickening agents. Uh, and we also thought it would be interesting to see how well it would work to print something without uh, adding, let's say, thantan or agar or something. Uh, so we thought that was also an interesting idea to look into. Uh, and I think faba beans, our whole group work a lot of faba beans. Uh, and this was just a different way to see how we can make use of them. Yes. And uh, maybe to add to what Matthias was saying, where to take it next? Well, um, we have actually, we did taste our cubes, for instance. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, Fanny, Matthias and me then, and I think we all agree that the, we prefer the carbohydrate uh, rich cubes, um, partly because they had this kind of more neutral uh, flavor. So if you would make it into a product, you could actually maybe put your own twist and spice it a bit easier than uh, the protein rich samples. And also the uh, when you chewed the samples, the protein rich ones almost became uh, clayey in the mouth like clay. Uh, so I mean, that would be very far in the future. And I guess also maybe looking into alternative um, drying methods as uh, freeze drying is uh, a very expensive, uh, expensive method. It's uh, quite also complex. Uh, yeah, 
scientifically. So um, those are two directions you could also go into optimizing product development and also looking into new, uh, yeah, what products you get by changing the drying method. Sounds very interesting. So, so then we can have a strawberry flavored uh, beans or cubicles in some time. Maybe at, at <laughs> least if we use uh, the carbohydrate rich ones. Um, yeah. So. Um, well, it really does seem very interesting. I think. Uh, do we have some more? Anyone else who is uh, interested in knowing more? Uh, so, and how long have you? How long have you actually been working with this? Uh, I don't know. Is it one and a half year or something? Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, what are you hoping for? I mean, will this be something that we will all be using in the future, or will it be on the shopping lists? Uh, maybe <laughs> not. Not our cubes, uh, <laughs> but maybe. <laughs> something utilizing fava beans uh, in a similar way, maybe. Um, I think okay. this was more or less kind of a proof of concept that we could use uh, these kind of materials for 3D printing of foods. Uh, and then hopefully someone else can, can have some nice idea of what to use it for also that might be beneficial. Okay, yeah. So, but the three, you said that the printer was actually in your lab already, so that's also quite fantastic. So you, yeah. Oh. So is it used for uh, anything else at the moment, the, the printer, or is it mainly for your research? No, I think we are the only one that used it the last years. Uh, so if so. anyone has a good idea on how the, um, it, that they would try uh, using a 3D printer, then we will contact you, is that the case? And um, yes, I think that's mm -hmm. would be interesting. So, okay, that's great. So, so, uh, so that uh, 3D printer is just for printing food, or is it for other stuff as well? No, it's a, it's a BioX 3D printer from Cellink. So it's originally not developed for for foods, uh, but it's extrusion based. Uh, I think they use it for like cell cultures or this kind of things. Uh, but could you use uh, any shape from Thingiverse and the print? <laughs> uh, or how do you prepare the, the cubes? Was it, uh, did you do the drawings by yourself for that one? Or? Uh, I don't, rem I think they have some models in the print already, uh, but it's relatively simple to make a drawing of your own. And then I think Cellink has a, uh, as a program for making this kind of slicing of the different layers uh, and infill patterns as well. Uh, but I think it was quite straightforward uh, to do on the web uh, to just uh, yeah, paint a, a cube and then put it in this program. Uh, well, very, very uh, exciting, uh, I think at least so. Um, well, if we don't have any, is there anything that you would like to add, Matthias and Chara? Something that you felt that uh, we should know a little bit more about? Uh, no, I think we are happy and glad that you all came to, to listen to us. So, Yes, it was great. We have quite many participants here, and this is also sent uh, via face, the library's Facebook page. So there are even more uh, people who have joined this seminar. So anyway, so if that's it, uh, I would like to thank you, Tara and Matthias, very, very uh, much. And uh, good luck with your future research in this exciting area. And uh, from the committee of the Worth, uh, worth Knowing, Vata uh, Tveta, I'd like to welcome you to the next uh, session, the next Vata uh, Tveta, uh, organized by the Ultuna Committee is the 10th of March, uh, and that is going to be about the use of bees by Eva Forsgren, and uh, then the next one organized by the Umeå uh, Committee is uh, what's going wrong with the Swedish eagles. That sounds very interesting, I think. So please follow us uh, and check the website of the Vat at Veta. Uh, because we have even uh, more exciting lectures to come this spring. <laughs>
So thank you everyone uh, and uh, hope to see you soon again.